If you're looking at two wolf cubs, Romulus and Remus, they sure are cute. And here they are at around eight months in age. I think they're beautiful. And they're not just beautiful. They are the unique result of genetic engineering. And if the biotech company that made them, Colossal Bioscience, are to be believed, they are the first representatives of a species extinct for around 12,000 years. Enocyandirus. This news, just released by Colossal Bioscience yesterday, has made quite a splash, even making the cover of Time magazine. It also raises questions, and I think we need to talk about it. I'm Professor Steve Rowe. I'm a real paleontologist, and you're watching Real Paleontology. So, allegedly, the fearsome direwolf is back. But is it really? And if it is, why? What purpose does it serve? But before we get into these questions, what even is a direwolf anyway? Well, it's a canid, a member of the dog family, and until recently, it was placed in the genus Canis, along with grey wolves, coyotes and such. But as of 2021, based on DNA data and published by Angela Perry and friends here, it's now in its own genus, Anacyon, which means terrible dog. This generic name was proposed over 100 years ago. It didn't catch on then, but now it's back. Anyway, Perry and Al conclude that it last shared a common ancestor with grey wolves, Canis lupus, way back, around 5.7 million years ago. To give you an idea of how significant this divergence is, the human lineage split from the last common ancestor with chimpanzees around 7 million years ago. Put another way, the grey wolf is much more closely related to the coyote than it is to the dire wolf. It's also now clear that the dire wolf was a homegrown all-American beast, unlike the grey wolf, which evolved in Eurasia and arrived in North America via the Beringian land bridge around 130,000 years ago. We also know that the dire wolf was a very successful predator and is a very common fossil find. It ranged through much of North America, including parts of Mexico. So the dire wolf was different, but how different? Well, the most obvious distinction between it and the grey wolf is that, on average, it was significantly larger. European grey wolves average around 39 kilos or so, whereas the largest subspecies of dire wolf averaged at around 60 kilos. Overall, the dire wolf was also more robustly built with a larger skull and proportionately larger teeth. A very important distinction is that the dire wolf had a considerably smaller brain for its size. Unfortunately, I've not been able to find detailed comparisons, but here's one between the grey wolf and coyote. And even between these two much more closely related species, there are notable differences in brain organisation and development. Until we have a much better idea of how the grey wolf and dire wolf compared in the brains department, we have almost no idea of differences in behaviour. Although it has been suggested that it was a less social animal than the grey wolf based on the fact that its brain was smaller. Okay, now there's obviously a lot more we could say about the dire wolf, but I'm going to keep a deeper treatment of it for a later episode. Here, I'm concentrating on what colossal biosciences have done, why they've done it, and whether it was a good idea. So firstly, what is colossal biosciences? Well, I covered this in an earlier episode on the extinction of the Tasmanian tiger, but basically it's a serious company valued at over $10 billion US. It's headed up by CEO Ben Lang and chief geneticist George Church here. The company's stated primary mission is the resurrection and rewilding of extinct species. In addition to the Tasmanian tiger and dire wolf, they aim to de-extinct the woolly mammoth and the dodo, among others. So, what's the deal with the dire wolf? Well, Colossal have evidently sequenced around 91% of the dire wolf's genome from two specimens, a 13,000-year-old tooth from Ohio and a 72,000-year-old ear bone from Idaho. It's worth pointing out 
that we have to take colossal biosciences at their word here. The details of what they've done and how they've done it have not been published in the scientific literature. What is clear though is that the animals they've created are 99.9% .9 grey wolf and certainly not 100% dire wolf, although they share a number of characteristics including larger size and more powerful jewels. Another interesting feature identified is that they had white coats. Of course, this doesn't mean that all dire wolves were white. Living grey wolves can be anything from black to white. Bottom line though is that these are hybrids, not 100% dire wolf. It's worth noting that Beth Shapiro, the Chief Science Officer of Colossal Biosciences, has defined success as generating individuals that are functionally direwolves, i.e. animals that look and behave like direwolves. Now straight up this latter point is a red flag to me. This is because we have very little insight into their behaviour, but given their smaller brains, we can be pretty darn sure that there were significant differences. And although colossal biosciences have pointed to features that their hybrids share with a direwolf, there has been no mention of brain size or shape, or what any such differences might mean. And frankly, to me, until we get some clarity here, on this basis alone, I have serious concerns over the value of the project. Anyway, for the sake of argument, let's put debate over the degree to which these hybrids might mirror actual direwolf anatomy and behaviour aside and ask why was it done and what's the plan? Well, according to CEO Ben Lam in this YouTube interview here, his inspiration followed a meeting with Indigenous leader Chairman Fox in South Dakota. Fox asked Lam why Colossal Biosciences was investing so heavily in extinct species that were not endemic to North America, that is, species that were only found in North America. Fox argued that the dire wolf was of cultural significance to his people and, more broadly, a symbol of American power. So, to date, Lamb does not appear to have given any direct ecological or conservation-based argument for resurrecting the dire wolf. As far as I've been able to ascertain, there is no clear plan. For now, the hybrids are kept in a secure, well-monitored 2,000-acre enclosure. What happens next is unclear. This contrasts with arguments for the de-extinction of the Tasmanian tiger. For the Tassie tiger, we know that humans were definitely responsible for its extinction, and it can be reasonably argued that its reintroduction might restore balance in Tasmanian ecosystems. This is because it was clearly the apex predator, and it preyed on larger species beyond the capacity of the next largest predator, the Tasmanian devil. This is the same argument used to support the reintroduction of the grey wolf to Yellowstone National Park. I go into this in more detail in my episode on the thylacine. Contrastingly, we don't know what drove the dire wolf to extinction. Was it humans? Was it climate change? Or was it simply nudged out by its invading Eurasian cousin, the grey wolf? For that matter, it could be any combination of these factors. It also obviously occupied habitats in the more distant past with very different climatic conditions and very different faunas. We don't know how dependent it was on extinct herbivorous species that also went extinct at the end of the last ice age, nor do we know the extent to which it competed with grey wolves. If there was a large niche overlap, then why spend big money to introduce an apex predator when we already have a native species that can do the job? On the other hand, if there wasn't much overlap and the dire wolf was reliant on extinct species, then obviously it may struggle if released into the here and now. And here's another question. What would happen if dire wolves and grey wolves overlap? The record suggests that the grey wolf would win out. But things have certainly changed over the last 12,000 years, and it remains possible that these changes favour a dire wolf lookalike. So, should we only introduce them into regions where grey wolves are absent? Now, I understand people's excitement here, I totally get it. But to me, in this instance, 
colossal biosciences have come up with a questionable solution in search of a problem. That said, I want to make it clear that although I have deep reservations with respect to this particular project, overall, I am a supporter of the work that they do. Aside from the thylacine project, which I think is definitely worthwhile, they are also doing work that will improve the health and diversity of species that have been squeezed through genetic bottlenecks. These include the American red wolf and American bison. And the cutting edge science that they're developing may yield all sorts of positive applications, not just in the conservation space, but in biomedical science too. What do you reckon? Are there flaws in my argument? You can have your say in the comments section below. And while you're at it, if you found this episode interesting, please like and subscribe. I'll be back next week with another episode of Super Predators.